Vampires used to roam the earth, and you can't convince me otherwise. Yes, I can. Watch this. These are burial cages from the medieval times, and they were to prevent the undead from escaping from their graves. No, they aren't, and no, they weren't. These are not called burial cages, and they definitely were not intended to keep the dead from rising out of their graves. I know that you're just making up your own facts in order to get views on a video, but the actual purpose of these is almost just as interesting as what you said. Um, so you could have just done that and it would have made a perfectly good video. But since you didn't, I suppose I should. I fully accept that right now I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit because just about every comment on his video is pointing out that these are not what he says they are. So at the risk of redundancy, these are not burial cages. They are called mort safes, and they were invented in the 1800s in England. In the early 1800s, it was common practice for medical students to learn anatomy on real human subjects. Obviously, no longer living human subjects. I would hope that goes without saying. Of course, the best place you could go to find an abundance of these subjects is a graveyard. There were people who made their living by supplying these places of higher education with subjects. They would do this by going to a graveyard shortly after a burial and liberating the recently deceased in the name of science. As you can imagine, people were like, whoa, that's my grandpa, hands off. So since the living didn't want to see their deceased family members exhumed and put under the scalpel by a bunch of hungover frat guys, they started to do this. They would lock the bodies into the ground. Now the one thing that unites us all as human is we all really love our burial rituals. So as you can imagine, people got pretty creative with their mort safe ideas. There were of course the metal cages that we were just looking at. These could either be opened by way of a padlock or one contiguous piece of metal. There were also designs like these ones where they would use large stones to make sure that no one could get to the ground underneath. Now, of course, these precautions were only available to the rich and famous who could afford this. But death truly is the great equalizer, so no matter what your financial status was in life, you could still be at the mercy of the body snatchers, meaning that poorer members of society had to figure out their own methods. People who could not afford mort safes would use cobblestones, pebbles, or flowers. And while these things didn't make it any more difficult for someone to exhume the remains, they did act as a bit of a detection system, with the intention that hopefully a family member would notice that it had been disturbed and be able to report it to proper authorities in time to catch the criminal. Alright, let's see what else he has to say. It would drive stakes through the mouths, hearts, hands, feet of the deceased. In order to pin them down to the ground. I will leave you with one word. Superstition. Do you want to know what you have in common with a bunch of people from the Middle Ages who didn't know any better? You both believe in vampires. There were people back then who were genuinely terrified of them and thought they were an actual threat. Now, of course, not knowing any better, they took precautions like these. This does not prove that vampires exist. If anything, it proves that human superstition is so deep-rooted that it can exist even at a time of the internet where every answer you could ever want is available at the push of a button. So let me leave you with this. Vampires do not exist, and we have never existed. New man just dropped. Sorry, I just really wanted to open my video that way. If you've been keeping up to date with any archaeological news, or really any news for that matter for the last couple of weeks, you may have seen this guy. The findings about this skull were published in a paper in the middle of last month. And in the archaeological subfield of human origins, this discovery has completely changed the way we think. So I am going to tell you everything you need to know about it. This skull has been dubbed the Dragon Man, despite bearing no resemblance to a dragon and only a little bit of a resemblance to a man. The skull was originally discovered in a mythical and mysterious land that some people like to call China. The skull was actually originally found in the 1930s by a man helping construct a bridge in the area. He was sifting around in the mud and he found and he correctly assumed that it was a very, very important piece of history. But since he didn't think that technology at the time would be able to do it justice, he hid it in a well for a very long time. With the increase of technology, as well as archaeological diligence, we are finally able to actually analyze this find. Now, the first question on everyone's mind with a discovery like this is, well, how old is it? Finding this out was difficult, though. Typically, when dating ancient remains such as this, we will use radiocarbon dating, a method which analyzes the amount of carbon-14 left over in remains. This is a great method of learning the age of natural objects, as long as they're between 3,000 and 60,000 years old because of the half-life of carbon-14. So instead, archaeologists had to whip out a whole different batch of things to test how old this skull is, including but not limited to x-ray fluorescence and analyzation of rare earth metals and strontium. Using these methods, archaeologists were able to determine the skull was between 140,000 years old and 310,000 years old, which is, for those of you at home, really fucking old. Typically, archaeologists would also look at stratigraphy, or the layers in which the bones or remains are deposited in order to tell how old something is. But the remains were moved from their original resting place, meaning that we have no access to the rest of the skeleton or anything he was buried with, lacking crucial evidence in this man's story. But the kicker of all of this was that after thorough analysis, it was determined that this is a brand new species. This is a fossil that has never been found before, which is just fucking awesome. Yet interestingly, this fossil shows a striking amount of encephalization, or the size of the cranium, almost matching that of Homo sapiens. This was one smart dude. Because this was a new fossil, it was an opportunity to give him a new name. And archaeologists have dubbed him Homo Longi, 
or homo longi, which I'm pretty sure is something that someone in AP Latin called me once as an insult. There are several theories as to who he is. My personal favorite is that he is a Denisovan. Denisovans deserve a video in and of themselves, but I'll surmise it here. Denisovans are an incredibly closely related extinct human ancestor. Yet despite how close they are to us, we have found so little physical evidence of them that they don't even have a scientific name. The closest thing we have found to a Denisovan's skull is a jawbone found in, I think it was Tibet, I think. And this man's skull matches very closely with that jawbone. Meaning that we may be looking at the first recreation of a Denisovan who has not walked the earth in nearly 150,000 years. And you're also present to a christening, because he has a name now. The archaeological debate over whether or not this man is a Denisovan will probably not be resolved until plenty of years of peer review. But I think it's special enough to know that we are the first to see this face in 150,000 years. You be careful what you wish for, because Pangaea is coming back. Throughout its four and a half billion years of existence, the Earth has formed seven supercontinents. This is my favorite, this is the supercontinent of Ur. It existed about 3.1 billion years ago and it looks fucking stupid. But there is an eighth supercontinent on its way and it's scheduled to make its debut in about 250 million years. This continent will be called Pangaea Ultima, and I'm going to tell you exactly how it's going to come to be. 10,000 years from now, humanity has burned itself out, and as our ivory towers return to dust, the cataclysmic effects we've had on the planet begin to heal. Our blink of existence was so inconsequential that our memory is quickly wiped from the face of the Earth as time marches on. 25 million years from now, the northward push of Africa has wiped out the Red Sea and turned into a sandy mountain range. Changes in Asia have stopped the Himalayans from rising and they begin to erode. 50 million years from now, California begins to erode into the sea and Alaska begins to move downwards. Meanwhile, the progression of the African continent into Europe has resulted in a large mountain range and has completely eliminated the Mediterranean Sea. 75 million years from now, Alaska and Russia connect, giving every anthropologist heart palpitations. 100 million years from now, the Earth looks like this. Forgive this part, I couldn't find a clean screenshot. The landmass from under Antarctica has started to move north into semi-tropical waters. Australia has decided to go hang out with China, and a new chain of islands is forming between Madagascar and New Guinea. Now is where it gets really fun. 150 million years from now, Antarctica has almost collided with Australia, India, and China all at once. Fortunately, we have broken off from Alaska, and the mountain range caused by Antarctica moving forward has fused with the top of the continent. Meanwhile, in the other half of the world, North and South America have divided from each other, and South America has become a chain of peninsulas. Meanwhile, Florida is thankfully gone, and California has fixed its drought problem. 175 million years from now, this section of Indian Ocean starts to become an inland sea, and the Himalayan mountains, which once dwarfed every other range on the planet, are now about the size of the Appalachians. 200 million years from now, and the Atlantic Ocean is close to being gone. The encroachment of landmass at the top and bottom of the sea, as well as this chain of newly formed islands, means that it is almost disconnected from the rest of the world's oceans. Meanwhile, the shattered remains of the Asian, Australian, and Antarctic continent have formed this impressive chain of islands. 225 million years from now, the once mighty Atlantic Ocean has become an inland sea. As these continents close, this inland sea will become a toxic wasteland. Meanwhile, a similar phenomenon begins to start here as the Indian Ocean is cut off from the now world-encompassing Propanthalassic Ocean. And finally, 250 million years from now, the supercontinent of Pangaea Ultima, or Pangaea Proxima, is formed. This small sliver is what remains of the Atlantic Ocean, and the remains of many of the world's continents can still be seen such as South America's western, the Indian Peninsula, even the southern part of Australia. But the part I want to direct you to is this. This was once the Indian Ocean, but unfortunately, as the South American Peninsula begins to move up, it will be cut off from the rest of the world. Now, this thing is massive. It almost looks like the same size as South America, and it will rapidly evaporate, and it is likely to become so toxic that it will cause a mass extinction event. I wish there was a way we could see what this continent would look like, and what sort of strange beasts would have adapted to this new environment. But unfortunately, we can only speculate. God, I love when you guys tag me and stuff like this. Let me preface by saying that giants and cyclopses never have existed. They never will exist, and there is no evidence for them ever existing. Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying to your face. Now, to some of you, that may be a bold claim, but allow me to break down the evidence that this guy uses in his video and show you that it is nothing more than pseudo-archaeological lies. And the only thing more full of shit than the people who perpetuate this fiction is the Deer Island Sewage Treatment Facility. The evidence presented is in the form of six images six images. Two of these six images are of actual skulls, so the only thing that could even be considered anything close to evidence. Let's talk about the skulls first. This is the first one. So this is actually the skull of a horse with a very rare mutation. This horse has what is medically known as holoprosencephaly, but is more commonly known as cyclopia. This is an incredibly rare birth defect, affecting about one in every hundred thousand newborns. The most obvious symptom of it is that the orbits of both eye sockets meet in the middle of the skull, creating this bizarre outcome. In fact, it's so rare that I could only 
find one other image of a horse bearing this disorder, which looks quite similar actually. Now the second image he uses is this one, and it is my favorite because it just goes to show how lazy and poorly informed this bullshit conspiracy is. Oh yes, this actually is a skull. This is a human skull. It is from a dig site in Iran. And now I'm gonna show you another image of it from a different angle. Can you figure out what it is yet? Can you figure out why this isn't a cyclops? Because that eye socket is the occipital foramen. It's the base of the skull where your spine connects. Look, the face is facing down. This is the bottom of the skull. They just put it on the wrong way. Are you stupid? Hey, let's talk about the drawings now. This is a picture from a medical textbook of someone with the exact same disorder that I was just talking about. Oh, and what's that? Another image of the same disorder I was just talking about. And look at that. It's another medical textbook drawing. Love it. So that's all of the actual evidence he presents. And then after that, he just goes on to showing random stock images of giants and cyclopses. You know, there's going to be one of you in the comments who's going to be like, oh, see, cyclopses do exist. There's that disorder you were talking about. But this person is talking about like a race of cyclopses, like cyclopses that walked amongst men. This is not what we are seeing presented in these images. In fact, none of the images presented even showed a human being with that disorder. It was a horse and a skull that was upside down. Let's just for a split second pretend that these two were actual cyclopses. Have a quick look at the skull structure of this, and now look at the skull structure of this. Do these look like they're the same animal? <laughs> no! Before you go buying into this conspiracy bullshit, please do a little bit of research. Literally just Google reverse image search what they're showing you, and it will prove to you that everything they're saying is just wrong. Please continue to tag me in these stupid videos because I love covering them. God, it pisses me off though.